Hey everyone, I'm Ferdinand and I'm the gathering director here at the River Church at our Holly location. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. We would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way to do that is to text River Connect, one word to 97,000, or you can visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and our upcoming events. If you'd like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can visit our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the message today. If you got a Bible, let's open those up to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter number three. We'll get there in just a few minutes. Great to be with you, though. Great to see you. If you're watching online, I want to welcome you as well. Before we jump in, a couple things to let you know about. Um, we are, uh, over the last, I said last week, we launched our Proverbs series, so we'll continue that through the summer. So my wife and I wrote a, a book uh, on the book of Proverbs, and so excited about that, excited about the reception uh, of the book so far. But what it is, is it's a kind of a guide through this summer series, and so just a way for us to stay connected to one another and to uh, the Word uh, over the course of the summer. Uh, so I would say go buy one of these. The problem is they're sold out, which I suppose is a good problem. So if you want to get one of these, we want to encourage you to go on Amazon, uh, and you can buy them uh, on there, okay? So again, it's not about me. I don't make any money off this book, so that's not the pitch at all, but just a way for you to stay connected uh, through the summer as we travel and uh, open houses and vacations and different things. So I want to keep you connected. Um, I also want to let you know when you came in the door today, you should have got just a, a kind of a little card there, a little takeaway about... Uh, something we launched a year ago called The Power of Three. Now, you may see those uh, banners or posters or, or different things. Uh, several years ago, we, uh, through our prison ministry, uh, received a check from an inmate. And the check was for $3. And it was just something that we, when we received, we were really blessed by, honestly, the sacrificial giving uh, of someone incarcerated that uh, working hard that they sacrificed and gave uh, to the ministry and uh, we're so blessed by it. And so we took kind of that as a, uh, a challenge for us as a church. And so we uh, launched a year ago um, uh, and, and several years ago, but just annually we've been doing this, uh, a capital campaign called The Power of Three in honor of that gift. And so over the last year, we've been raising money for our parking lot. You may have noticed that we really don't have a parking lot. There's a field with some rocks in it that we park in. And uh, so that's what it's turned into. So we are in the process of raising money for that. So over the last year, which is great, we've raised $160,000. And so we're going to um, start a portion of the parking lot over the next uh, few weeks. But want to encourage you to continue to give to that. And uh, we want to wrap that project up. Honestly, love to wrap it up in the next uh, year just to raise the money and to be done with that. So I want to encourage you just above and beyond what you regularly give uh, to sacrificially give to that project, okay? And then across all of the locations today, the different location pastors are uh, sharing the vision for Power of Three at their specific location. And so it's been neat to see those projects over the last year uh, at the other locations and just the amazing things that God uh, is doing. All right, let's get to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter number three. And um, if you are a father in this room or you're a father watching online, I want to encourage you to take a deep breath because you're about to get lit on fire, okay? Um, so that goes for both of us or for all of us. And um, so just, I feel like this sermon should come with a warning label, okay? Proverbs chapter number 3, and let's look at verse number 11 and 12, and then we'll jump back and, and look at a few things from the book of Proverbs. But the Bible says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, or be weary of his reproof. 
For the Lord reproves him who, whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Now jump back to Proverbs chapter number 1. Proverbs chapter number 1, verse number 8. The Bible says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction. Last fall, we began, a, we, we did a series on the Sermon on the Mount. And one of the things that I was struck by with the Sermon on the Mount was that the Sermon on the Mount is a conversation between Jesus and his disciples, Jesus and his close followers. The crowd literally just comes around and overhears the instruction. The same thing is happening here in Proverbs. Proverbs is wisdom that a father is imparting to his son. So I think in some of these cases of the book of Proverbs, it's actually Solomon speaking to his son as the, as the book, kind of a collection of wisdom. It was a wise teacher instructing his student or kind of his adopted son, if you will. And so you'll see this phrase, Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 10, you'll see the phrase, my son. Proverbs chapter number 2 and verse 1, my son. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 1, my son. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 1, hear, O sons, a father's instruction. Look at chapter 4 and verse number 3. Solomon says, when I was young with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me. And so uh, here it is. Solomon is remembering that he was taught by his father, his father being King David. And then now he is sitting down with his young son, likely a teenage young man, sitting him down and saying, my son, we need to talk about some different things. And so I want to go back to chapter 3 and verse number 11 and 12, and that's kind of going to be our uh, text that we will settle in today. But here is a father having a conversation with his son. Now, any time that we uh, speak about fathers, I realize for many of you sitting here, some of you watching online, that, that comes with some with some baggage of different types. Uh, maybe you had a great dad, and your dad just passed away. And so it will come with a, uh, maybe some grief or some, some sorrow over recent loss. Uh, for others of you sitting here, it's, uh, you had a dad that was not a good dad, not a good father. Maybe was present in body, but absent in heart and mind. Uh, for some, your, your dad left. For some, you don't know your dad. Now, for others, uh, thinking of a father, it's a source of, of deep sorrow, whether that's because of um, abuse, uh, maybe uh, verbal or emotional uh, or sexual abuse or physical abuse of some kind. And so anytime we tread into this area, it really is um, challenging because it comes with um, certain emotions for us. It also comes with emotions if you're sitting here watching and you're a father because um, maybe you reflect on your own failures or your own mistakes or your own regrets or uh, hopes that just didn't seem to uh, come to fruition. And so there's a lot of emotion there. But I want to, for a moment, step back and honestly share with you what has truly blessed me personally uh, from the book of Proverbs over the last nearly a year as I've been kind of studying and writing and preparing and thinking about these things. Hold your spot in Proverbs 3 and go forward into the New Testament for just a moment to the right to the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 8. If 
you don't have a Bible, I just want to encourage you, you can pull out your phone. You can download the River Church app or another Bible feature, and you can follow along. I certainly want you to be able to see the Scripture. Romans chapter number 8 says this in verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So sons and daughters, offspring, children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Here's kind of the story of the Bible and and our story in general. We were created in the image of God. Every person ever born for all time is created by God. No person is an accident. Whether they feel that way or whether they were told that they were an accident, every person is made in the image of God, uniquely created in the image of God. But we sinned against God. We rebelled against God. We violated God's righteous standards. And so we abandoned our Heavenly Father. We walked away because of our desire for sin. And God in His kindness, God in His love, God in His benevolence sent His only begotten Son, Christ, to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. Jesus rose from the dead. And it's through what Jesus did that our Heavenly Father, our Creator, is able to adopt us back into his family. Now, I don't want you to turn there, but I just want to put this in spiritual perspective, or I guess an important spiritual perspective. When we are born into this world, and Jesus says this in John chapter number 8, in verse number 44, he says this to the religious leaders. I want you to think about that. He says, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. So there's really only two spiritual family trees. There is the family tree of God and there is the family tree of Satan. Satan's family tree being, of course, a very violent family. Murderer. He's, the, he's a murderer from the very beginning. Satan's family tree being filled with lies. So deception, deceit, uh, untruths. And so when we're born into this world, we are not born children of God. We are actually born children of Adam. And Adam, our ancestor in Genesis chapter 3, rebelled against God. And now we have all joined this fallen family, the, Satan, the family of Satan. Well, Jesus doesn't leave us there. Jesus makes a way through his death and resurrection for us to change family trees, for us to be adopted into the family of God. And so when Paul is celebrating here, he says when the Spirit of God comes to live inside of you, meaning you've repented of your sin and believed in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit lives in you, you have received the Spirit of adoption. God has chosen you. God has rescued you. And now the relationship is restored, is redeemed. We are rescued and transferred from the domain of darkness, the family tree of Satan, and brought into the kingdom of his blessed son. We're brought into the family of God. And so now we can call out to God as Abba, Father. Abba being a very, very tender term. For us in English, it would be like daddy. It'd be a very tender, uh, um, you know, intimate term that we have with the Heavenly Father. And so going back now, let's go back to Proverbs chapter number 3. Yes, Solomon is the main character here and the main voice. 
but superseding him is God. And so for each of us, men and women alike, God is sitting us down in Proverbs and saying, son, we need to talk. If I were speaking to my daughters, I would say, sweetie, we need to talk. That's what God is doing to us because of what Christ did for us. Our family tree is changed. Our legacy, our direction in life is completely altered. And so here in Proverbs, it begins, as we talked about last week, begins with the Lord And he is the ultimate father. So God is the father here in the book of Proverbs. And God is showing men how to be fathers. So here's the thing. We need to spend time with the father so we know how to be a father. And the hope is, and I I would go on a limb here, but I think pretty firm, the hope is, that our children grow to live peaceful, joyous, uh, in some sense, happy lives. Well, where is that found? That's found only in the Lord. It's found only in walking in harmony and fellowship with their heavenly Father through the work of Christ. And so what a father is doing, this is kind of just the crux of this whole passage we're going to look at, A father is looking to the Heavenly Father, learning from the Heavenly Father, and then copying the Heavenly Father for his children. Here's why. Because eventually, guys, we have to step out of that and realize that we want our children to be in relationship with their eternal father. And so for now, a dad looks to the Father, whether your children are young or whether your children are grown, we look to the Heavenly Father so we know how to be a father, but we know that our time as a dad will come to an end so that we can step back and that connection is already made. Meaning this, when a father poorly reflects the Heavenly Father, the children, a son, a daughter, begin to go, okay, that's what my dad is, that must be what the Heavenly Father is. That's why this idea of God as Heavenly Father is so difficult for men and women who have suffered abuse, who have suffered uh, sin. They've been sinned against by their own earthly father. And so that's why this relationship is so difficult because now the, the son or daughter looks to God and goes, oh, well, that must be what God is like. And so there's a long time for the Word of God to begin dismantling that thought process and rebuilding a healthy view of a father. And so our goal is to look at the passage and see that God is showing us how to be a father and that eventually our kids will look beyond us to their eternal heavenly father. Now, with that in mind, let's look at Proverbs chapter 3 in verse number 11. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. Now, I want you to see three things the Lord does to us or does for us as our Heavenly Father. And really what we're seeing is three, you can divide it up into four, but we'll just put it into three for now. Three things that you and I are supposed to do for our children. You see there in verse number 11, you see the word discipline and reproof. In verse 12, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. So the first things we want to look at, we want to look at discipline. You'll see the word reproof, and then in verse number 12, you'll see the word reproves. So first thing that our, a heavenly, excuse me, that our heavenly father does that an earthly father is supposed to do is to discipline his sons and daughters. Discipline. Now, I just want to show you the passages. Jump over to Proverbs chapter number 13. And if you've got a highlighter or a pen, I'm going to give you these passages of Scripture. 
Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 24. The Bible says, Whoever spares the rod hates his son. But he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Now notice there is a rod of correction here. There is discipline. And there is diligence in doing that. Meaning, it isn't fun. It's hard. But there is a diligence that a father must commit to. Proverbs chapter 19, let's go there. Proverbs chapter 19, verse number 18. The Bible says, Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. Meaning this, discipline your son while there's time. Otherwise, when that window of opportunity for discipline shuts, you've basically set your son or your daughter on a course with death. Proverbs 22. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 15. Folly, which we'll talk about her in a few weeks. Folly is the embodiment, the, um, the archetype of foolishness. So folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Jump over to chapter number 23, and verse 13. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. Okay? A saying I grew up with is, uh, children are like canoes, best steered with a paddle in the rear. <laughs> a saying I always grew up, grew up hearing, and it always made me laugh. Verse 14, if you strike him with the rod... You will save his soul from Sheol, from, from death, from hell. And one more, Proverbs 29. Discipline your son, and he will give you rest. Rest. He will give delight to your heart. Can I tell you why a lot of people don't like their kids? Because they don't discipline them. It's just simple. Now, in no way, shape, or form am I going to say that my wife and I are perfect parents. She still has a lot of work to do. Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We are so... What's that? I, I can't read lips. You know that, but I know I'm going to die, basically. <laughs> so we, we're so far from being perfect parents. But, man, when I tell people that I have three teenagers living at home, their look of pity on their face, they cannot hide. Like, yeah, we got a 17-year-old, a 16-year-old, and a 14-year-old. And they're like, oh, gosh. And I'm like, actually, it's not that bad. Now, my kids aren't perfect. Far from it. They're, they're just like your kids. They're just young men and two young ladies. But I, it's so sad to me that it's just assumed that because you have teenagers, it's miserable. We often will counsel with parents and frankly, my wife and I believe that terrible twos come from bad parenting in the ones.
Discipline is hard. Discipline takes diligence. Discipline is about having conversations. You'll see discipline and reproof. So it's about having corrective conversations. It's about constantly keeping that channel of communication open. You, you see the son there. It's about saying, the father saying to the son, I love you. But I think as Christians, this is what we need to remember. Discipline is discipleship. Discipline is discipleship. Meaning correction. And so many parents are afraid of that. We long to, as we'll look at the passage in a moment, we long to delight in our kids, but we don't want to put the work in of discipline that it takes to get there. And so parents are lazy. We think that what our kids need is just more stuff or more opportunity. And so we just live in a generation that just is, well, let's get them more stuff and let's get them more opportunity and all these different things. And moms and dads, and let's just zero in on fathers, do not commit to diligently discipline disciplining their sons and their daughters. And guess what? We're reaping the repercussions of that. We're living in it. My wife and I, yesterday, we went to an antique fair. And uh, if you've never been there, don't do it. Uh, So, so... We go, and it's nice to walk around. I'm just amazed at the amount of junk people have. And then I'm amazed at the amount of money that they think said junk is worth. You're like, really? That is worth $500? No, it's not. That would be in the dumpster at my house. And so you just did the amount of stuff. And so we wandered around, and we we bought a handful of things, and we just we had a good time together. And so I I always always go to this little thing because I look for the one vendor because I love books. And so there's this guy that brings in all these old books and stuff, and so I like to go peruse the books. And so I'm perusing the books, and I go past that, and then there's this other booth that I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And there was this, this um, like model, old model Jeep thing. And you could tell someone had glued everything together, and I mean, it was the things I couldn't do as a kid because I wasn't patient or that skilled with, with fine motor skills. And uh, so, um, and so I was, you know, I'm, for me, I know the rules. I'm going to touch something, I'm going to break it. So my hands are in my pocket, especially if it's something I know I can't afford. And so I'm just looking at these couple of things, and I watch this little boy run up, grab the, Jeep, grab the Jeep, and drop it on the ground. Pieces. And I'm like, oh my goodness gracious. I'm looking at the dad. I'm looking at the boy. I'm looking at the dad. I'm looking at the boy. He's like, did you drop that? I'm like, hmm. I felt bad. I, I, I shrunk down to like a three-year-old boy at that point. Like, Mm-mm, no, I didn't. Mm-mm. It was him, right? And uh, so he, he drops it. And so I'm, I'm just kind of looking at him. Did you drop that? Yeah. Okay, we'll pick it up. Put it there. All right, let's go over here. And I was like, what? So I squat down and I start picking the pieces up and setting it next to the Jeep. And I'm like, dude, you break it, you buy it, right? It's it, like, that's the rule. So I'm like, oh my goodness, I right know. And I'm a rule follower in life. And so my wife's a rule breaker. I'm a rule follower. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, someone broke something, you know? And so I walk over to the lady. I'm like, I don't mean to be a snitch, but that little boy over there dropped that Jeep on the ground and it shattered. I'm going away now. I just was like, this is crazy. And so I, I told Jen this story. She goes, well, you can add that into the sermon tomorrow. And I thought, I can. Because here was like, eh, okay. Discipline takes diligence. To a Christian, discipline is part of discipleship. 
Now go back to Proverbs chapter 3. The goal is for earthly fathers to copy, emulate, model the heavenly father so that our sons and daughters will see what the heavenly father is like. So here it is, verse 11. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. So that's like correction when things have gone wrong. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves. One commentator said it this way, that discipline is evidence of love. So last fall, when I was, was Jen and I were laying out this, this book and came to the Father chapter, I, I settled in on this verse here, verse 11 and 12. And I thought, why don't more dads commit to consistent discipline, diligent discipline? Why are we watching dads shrug their shoulders? Like, not just little kids, but like high school, middle school students. Eh, whatever. And it's almost like this, this, this surrender that oh, it is what it is. And I really started to wrestle with this question here. The Bible says, For the Lord reproves him whom he loves. Whom he loves. Now I want you to hold your spot here in Proverbs. I want you to go into the New Testament to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews uh, chapter number 12. So the writer of Hebrews is going to quote the verses we've been looking at, Proverbs 3, 11, and 12. So there at the end of verse number 5, so Proverbs, or excuse me, Hebrews 12, 5. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one whom he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Verse 7. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are all left without discipline in which, excuse me, if you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Now, this passage always makes me laugh because I've never heard being disciplined described as participated. Verse 8. Like, I never voluntarily participated in discipline. Like, ooh, I'm so excited to participate in this as a kid, right? Like, but the Bible is saying, if there's discipline doled out in your home to the family, and all of the kids are disciplined, but you're not, then the Bible is saying, you're, you don't belong. You're illegitimate. You're not a son. Besides this, verse 9, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Every parent in here wants their child to live a peaceful life. There's a description there. The peaceful fruit of righteousness. So the father, a, a, a genuine, legitimate father, ought to hope for his sons and daughters. That comes through commitment to discipline. Well, discipline is an outflow of love. Love. So I started wrestling with the question, 
Do fathers really love their children? And of course, I think there's a lot of dads who would say, yeah, I love my kids. But I look back at things in my life and I look at society and I look at men in our church and sometimes I go, yeah, I think you love a whole lot of other things more. I think you love your job more. I think sometimes we love our sin more. I'm not even trying to be mean to anybody in the room, but the amount of fathers that spend hours and hours and hours a year gazing at pornography think some dads love pornography more than they love their sons, love their daughters. Some it's work, some it's sexual sin, some of it's money, some of it's hobbies. Career, toys. You love your sons and daughters? Oh, yeah, yeah, I do. But then all the energy, time, and effort goes everywhere else. And then we like to tell ourselves lies. Well, why are you working so much? I'm working for my kids. No, you're not. To me, I think that's at the root of why dads don't discipline. because we're disengaged in all these other things. Let's go back to Proverbs 3. Discipline. As we read earlier, discipline is evidence of love. Of course, the discipline evolves and changes. It becomes more reproof. It becomes more loving conversations, conversations of concern. If you have grown adult children here, you're like, okay, this isn't for me. Like, no, no, no. As a father, you, you may need to sit down your grown son or your grown daughter and say, hey, I love you. I'm concerned about some things in your life. I love you and I have the courage to say to you, hey, the way you're acting, what you're doing, what I'm seeing you posting is not good. Here's the damage. Here's, here's the path that you're on. That is evidence of love. It's evidence of commitment. The Bible says there in verse 12, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. I wasn't going to go to this passage, but turn to the left and go to the book of First Samuel. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 27. It's 
a story about a man named Eli. And Eli was the high priest. And Eli had uh, two sons. They were wicked men. They were not little boys. Their names were Hophni and Phinehas. Verse 27, there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar and to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. So didn't I, I chose your family, the, the family of Aaron. He said, I gave to the house of your father all the offerings. Why then, verse 29, why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening yourself on the choicest parts of every offering of my people of Israel? So these Hophni and Phinehas, they were acting immoral, they were stealing, they were sexually manipulating the people. And that phrase right, right there in verse 29 has really been something that I've thought about over the last several months. The prophet says to Eli, why do you honor your sons above me? The end of the story is that God says, because you did this, it's over. And one day, Eli's family tree comes to a terrible end. Just crash and burn. We want to we wanna delight in our kids. We, we long for that. but I see so many dads who think that that's just gonna, they're just gonna turn a corner someday and then just magically have this relationship with their sons and daughters that they have never had. It's just gonna, it's just gonna form out of thin air. Like, oh, there it is. My sons and my daughters, they know the Lord. Awesome, that happened. That was weird. I don't know how it happened, but I'm gonna enjoy it. That won't be the case. And so many Christian fathers, so many men sitting in this room or watching online are not committed to discipline or reproof, not committed to courageous conversations with their sons and daughters, frankly, because I think we love a whole lot of other things more than we love the Lord and then love our kids. And I believe we forfeit the joy of delighting in them later on. For me, I know that there have been many times that I have poorly reflected the Heavenly Father to my son and to my daughters. Those, those stories and those moments grieve me deeply. You ever wonder why pastor's kids are typically the worst kids on planet Earth? Or if you're a PK in here, you know it to be true. And I'm looking around and I know some of you PKs and it's really true, okay? I'm just kidding. But we know it to be true. And oftentimes why that happens is because the pastor loves the church more than his sons and daughters.
So I'm going to give you something that I think about a lot. Priorities. Number one, if you're a man trying to honor the Lord and be a godly father, number one priority in your life is to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. That must be your first priority so that you're spending time with the Father so that you know how to be a father. And the crazy thing about being a father, man, is it ebbs and flows and changes. The seasons are are different. It's weird in my life to parent a 17-year-old and parent a 7-year-old. It's weird. And I feel like I'm bad at both. So it's a weird thing. Some of you are like, now I'm parenting a 30-year-old, a 50-year-old. I'm parenting a child who's now a, (laughs) my son or daughter who's now a parent and a grandparent. You have to spend time with the Heavenly Father to be able to do that well. So number one priority of every father in here ought to be your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Number two, your second priority must be your wife must be your wife, not your kids, not your kids. Years ago I heard, and I just kind of something, I piece of advice I thought was great, other than the gospel, the greatest gift that you can give to your children is a good marriage, your marriage, your spouse, your wife. That must be your second priority. Number three, your kids. And what's interesting about those is your wife needs to know she's your second priority after the Lord. Not you telling her, hey, you, you are my highest human priority. If she says, no, I'm not, I don't believe that, then you got some work to do. And your kids and then everything else after that. For me as a father, what I have found is that if I am living my priorities out, man, it's a lot more delightful in life. For me, I've said this to you as a pastor before, but I say this as a a man, as a husband, as a father, the church is not my top, top priority. It's not even in the top three. For a lot of men, we might say that those are our top priorities, but we do not live those out. And so we don't have the emotional bandwidth in our life, we don't have the energy to discipline or to have difficult conversations, reproving our sons and daughters, addressing serious problems. I mean, the amount of parents that I'm watching handing their sons and daughters a phone and hoping for the best is absolutely ludicrous. It's ludicrous. Here's a phone. Don't look at anything bad. Yeah, right. That's why the Bible says folly is bound up in the heart of a child. But it takes diligence for a father to stay in the fight. Motivated by love with the end goal of delighting. You know that's what God does with us? Sometimes, uh, like my youngest daughter, she's, she's, um, she's the question asker in our life. She asks questions about everything. <sighs> this morning was, are people and animals the same? So we had to have a conversation on the road talking about how animals are not the same as people and were created in the image of God and we have a soul. And then Jen's like trying to explain a soul. And I'm like, 
I don't want to have to try to explain a soul. You figure that out, right? All these different, different uh, questions. Well, sometimes it, it comes to, okay, so when we leave, who's in charge? Okay, Claire's in charge or Belle's in charge, okay? And you're, you're to listen to them. And so the way the leadership goes is that um, you submit to parents and then mom, out of reverence for Christ, submits to me. So then she'll go, well, who, who are, who's in charge of you? And I'm like, well, God is in charge of me. And sometimes he has to discipline me. And by sometimes, I mean quite regularly, the Lord has to discipline me. So the Lord loves me because he is my heavenly father and he disciplines me. He is sanctifying me because one day for eternity, we will delight in each other. The Lord will delight in me as an object of his grace and salvation and I will delight in my Savior and in my Lord and in my eternal Father. That's the eternal end goal. We want to picture that for our sons and daughters with the goal of delighting in them. So more fathers have to commit to discipline and reproof that reflects the Heavenly Father. That's not abusive or berating or antagonizing or stirring up anger or provoking, but that is loving, consistent, caring, dedicated, with the hope long-term of delighting in your sons and daughters. With the hope of one day stepping out and saying, I want you to be dependent on the Lord. I can't discipline you anymore, but the Lord is going to discipline you. And the Lord is going to be there. And when I'm dead and gone, you can depend on the Lord. He'll be there for you because he is your eternal heavenly father. He's your forever father. That is the sacred, holy, serious responsibility of being a father. And we need more dads that will say, I'm in for that. And maybe that means less time in the garage. Maybe that means less time at work. Maybe that means less money. Maybe that means less time with your hobby. And that means more one-on-one -on -one personal time, quantity of time, so that within the quantity of time you can have possibly quality time with your sons and with your daughters. I'm going to ask you to do this across the room. I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads and close your eyes. Guys, I hope that you know my heart today. It's not to be mean to you or to ridicule you or to say that I've figured this out because I am have not. But just in the quietness of this moment, you are a father. And you have abandoned that sacred responsibility of discipline, of having courageous, corrective conversations. Maybe you've fallen in love with other things. Your priorities are messed up. You long for that peaceful fruit of righteousness, that time where you can delight in your sons and daughters, but you have abandoned your post for other things. If that's you, 
No one's looking around. I don't want to shame you. Just say, Josh, would you, would you pray for me that I can be a father that reflects the Heavenly Father? If that's you, I just want you to just slip up your hand. I'm just going to pray for you. If that's you, the Holy Spirit's moving in your heart. Just pray for me, Josh. Thank you, guys. Put them down.